Rwanda's banking sector last year consisted of nine commercial banks and five institu uh, specialized institutions. However, banking sector penetration still remains low, with the ratio, ratio rather, of total banking sector assets to GDP standing at 28% in local currency terms. For more on the banking sector and the prospects in Rwanda, I'm joined by George Bodo, head of the Financials Desk at EcoBank Research. George, thanks for your time. So you've uh, written a report on Rwanda's banking sector, and the title there size does matter uh, we know that the bank of kigali if we're talking about dominant banks 496 million dollars in assets and that uh, almost a third of total banking sector assets so take us through uh, the key players right now and what are some of the key changes we've seen in the past year in the, in the banking sector um thanks a lot i think the key i take away from the the note and our survey is the fact that uh, uh, rwanda's banking sector continues to grow um, even though if you look at it from the wider East African con uh, context, um, it, still, it still trails um, its major East African peers in asset terms. At 1.6 billion, it's almost, the, uh, if, you look, if you rank it in, in the, the, the context of Kenya, Ta Rwanda, and Tan sorry, Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, it's still the lowest. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, 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 and I mean, Kenya has, 20, at, at the close of 2012, Kenya had 27 billion US dollars worth of assets. Tanzania had about nine and Uganda had about six. So you can see how much far behind Rwanda is. But the good thing is that it's a growing sector and uh, it continues to grow and continues to attract new players. And I mean, the latest entrant being uh, Kenya's Industrial and Mortgage Bank, and um, which acquired a 55% stake in a bank, bank commercial in Rwanda, which is BCR, mm -hmm. which, I, which interestingly is also the most profitable bank in Rwanda uh, from a profitable point of view. Mm -hmm. But if you, look at the, if you look at the profitability in the whole context, uh, Rwanda is still not one of the most, it's th the least profitable sectors. Um, the return on equity of about 13%. Um, uh, Kenya generated a return of equity of 30%, 30 mm -hmm. at the close of 2012. Um, Uganda was at 27%, and Tanzania just closed at th third at 14%. So you, you can also see that Rwanda banks, in as much as they're growing asset, there's still a lag in terms of shareholder wealth creation. Mm -hmm. um, so hence the fact that they're lagging the East, in their major East African peers in terms of profitability. Mm -hmm. So why is that? I mean, what are the, is it a function of size? I mean, what are the dynamics playing into that a relatively low ROE of 13%? Uh, I think it's a function of, uh, of the yield. If it's a function of two key things. One is the yield on, on, on their earning assets. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also, it's also a function of cost. And if you look at cost in terms of efficiency levels, again, Rwandan banks are the most inefficient in the region. Um, on average, at the close of 2012, um, they, they, they run up to cost income ratio of 72%. Um, last year, it was uh, again 71%. So if you compare, um, uh, if, if, you put, if you put them on the scale, then you find that Kenya is at 57%. Both Uganda and Tanzania average at 60%. So you find there's a, there's a huge uh, uh, spread in terms of efficiency across the region. So there's still some gap to be done in the, in the Rwandan banking sector in terms of you know, cost containment and, and, and putting in place a robust cost management strategy. Again, also, if you look at the yield on earning assets, I mean, I, I'll tell you that you know, Rwandan assets, uh, Rwanda domiciled assets, especially in the local currency assets, they're not really high yielding. You know? As for example, if you look at the government treasury bills on average terms, they were yielding about 7%. You know? Um, and that is between 20, 2011 and 2012. Yeah. And if you, if, you, if, if, you, if, you, if you go to, for example, Kenya, which was the most profitable banking sector in the region at the close of 2012, you know, the same T-bill was yielding about 12, 13 percent in the same period. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a function of those two factors, you know, yeah. cost management and, and the yield on earning assets. What about, uh, you know, sweating the assets further? I mean, do you see, uh, do you see pressure on the banks uh, to, to bring down those cost to income ratios uh, because 71 percent is by any standards quite high? Um, or do you think that there's just not enough competition right now for banks really to, to focus uh, specifically on the cost side of the equation? I think cause of the, the major thing here is um, the fact that the biggest co cost component, if you look at the whole cost base in, in the sector, the biggest component is the operating cost. And, 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 and if you go back to the history of, of the banking sector, it, it's only a few years ago that the government um, decided to divest from the banking sector and leave it to the private sector. And that, you know, generally where, when the government has invested in, in, the, in the banking sector, the, normally, the government does not, uh, is not never concerned about uh, efficiency. So 
Um, and, and we've seen it even in some banking sectors, even in Kenya, uh, where there was a strong government presence. There is no emphasis on, on, on efficiency. So it's just a thing that comes to the government. Mm -hmm. So I think um, um, there's, there's a gradual, the, the banking sector in Rwanda is gradually you know, um, growing out of the government name and the government brand. Mm -hmm. And I think with time, the next three years, they will be below the recommended 60%. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, you, I agree with you, 72% is very high. Yeah. Uh, Umurenge is uh, the cooperative local banking operations that really also are, uh, you know, helping to, to grow banking penetration. So tell us about how they operate and how they fit into the broader financial sector. You know, it's a very interesting concept when you go to Rwanda um, and then um, the Umurenge so Sako, Sako system. It, it was a project by the government to increase financial inclusion. And actually, if you actually look at the financial inclusion levels and the pro banking sector product penetration, it's quite high. I mean, the, the percentage of adults, the bankable adults are accessing uh, both formal and informal financial services is about 72%. And that's even the highest. I mean, in the East African region, the whole of the region, there is no country that has achieved that same feat. So if you go back and, and, and if, re if you work backwards, you find that uh, at the grassroots level, there is this Umurenga thing which it, it in simple time means sector. So it's a savings based at the sector level, at the grassroots level, that ensures that people can access the, the basic formal financial services. So you find that uh, since the inception three years ago, um, about a million people have signed up to Umurenge. And then the funny thing, the interesting thing, sorry, is that these people are net savers. They, they are not net borrowers, they are net savers. They actually save more than they borrow. So on, on an, uh, at the moment, so the how does government tap into deposit. that savings pool, George? I think it, it's not about the government tapping in the savings schemes. It's about the banking sector tapping in the banking, uh, the major banks, the, 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 the core commercial banks, tapping into the, those savings and see how they can help, it can help fund them. I think at the moment, um, the deposits that are sitting with the Morenga societies are not so much, about 4% of the, the whole banking sector deposit, but it's growing, you know. In, in the next five years, it's going to change the whole funding game, and banks are going to be relying on the, on the, on the Umurenge circles for funding, and, and it's going to change the whole, you know, the whole funding game, so the banking sector. So I think it's a key thing to watch, and I think even in other countries, it's something that they can adopt, you know, to mm -hmm. increase financial inclusion.